Um, a warm welcome to David Volkerts Landau, who is joining us, uh, not as I thought from New York or London, but from Germany. Welcome, David. Um, um, just a short introduction to you. You studied uh, mathematics and economics at Harvard, got a PhD in economics from Princeton. You worked with the IMF and joined Deutsche Bank in the late 1990s. And you are the global head of research and the group chief economist of Deutsche Bank. Um, I'm very glad that you accepted our invitation and you will talk about, uh, well, the uh, glo very global, very global stuff, the US and China shaping the global political economy in the 2020s. Um, that will be an outlook uh, until at least the midterm elections uh, that we will have end of next year in the US. So we will have uh, your talk and uh, all those who have questions should uh, raise them in the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, we'll then have a discussion and I will be happy to uh, moderate a little bit uh, the, the questions then uh, that, uh, that uh, will be asked. That's all I have to say, David. Thanks again for joining us at the Focus <clears throat> uh, Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here and speak to you today. Uh, this is a somewhat unusual audience for me. Uh, typically, I talk to global investors uh, and to macro funds and corporate CEOs, but uh, I'm very delighted to be here. And uh, Otmar Ising uh, uh, asked me to uh, join this group, and uh, uh, I've known Otmar for a long time, uh, and he thought that maybe somewhat different perspective than uh, what comes out of the usual macro uh, economists might be interesting. Um, I just want to say a few words. So Otmar, during his very remarkable career, uh, um, is something of intellectual conscience for us. Uh, in the sense that he reminds us that, that some of our fundamental propositions in monetary economics, that they are still very valid uh, and need to be heeded. Uh, I mean, just because you can get away with a monetary or fiscal policy that looks good and feels good in the short run, doesn't mean you won't have to pay for it later. Uh, there are some truths that matter sooner or later, uh, and particularly these days where it's hard not to get swept away by consensus. Uh, but Otmar has taught us, by example, to be uh, steadfast in remembering what we've learned the hard way without ever being dogmatic. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for uh, keeping the faith, Otmar. Um, to start with, let me slightly redirect from uh, uh, what you said I was going to talk about. I thought I'd talk about the pandemic and uh, about the US and uh, how I believe ultimately uh, uh, this will shape out over the next couple of years rather than just focus on uh, the China-US issue. Uh, first two observations. Uh, the first one is that this is a different type of downturn, a different type of recovery. Uh, the pandemic lockdown is not a typical cyclical downturn. Uh, instead, it is an exogenously forced shutdown of certain sectors of the economy. And that makes the dynamics radically different from the periodic cyclical uh, downturns that we've come used to in, in, in the business cycle over the last uh, 50, 60 years. Um, and the, the, the timing and the dynamics tend to be very different. Uh, uh, most forecasts initially underpredicted the speed and depth of the downturn, and then completely underpredicted the speed and extent of recovery. Uh, you remember all these conversations about forecasts where it was a U a U-shaped downturn, whether it was an L-shaped downturn. Uh, well, it was, it turns out to have been a V-shaped downturn, very different than what many people expected. Now, the, the typical downturn, uh, cyclical downturn is caused, of course, by central bank-induced monetary contraction or by a financial crisis involving the bursting of a market bubble or, uh, or the implosion of excess leverage, uh, like we saw in 2008. Uh, and this involves reduction of workforce, changing of investment plans, that all takes time. The, the, the lockdown, uh, on the other hand, is a localized economic coma, that's the best way to describe it, which produces a very fast, very deep downturn in growth and employment. Um, and the recovery then also happens very fast because you just simply open it re-up. 
uh, and households don't need to rebuild balance sheets and banks don't need to worry about uh, preserving their capital stock as far as the lending is concerned. <clears throat> so it's a very different upturn and downturn. This has taken us a while to understand and uh, it, it also has had some implications for the policy as that have been uh, implemented. So <clears throat> the, the, the policy responses were not entirely appropriate initially. Uh, in, in particular, demand management policies just don't help you very much when you're shutting down part of the economy and people can't go to stores and buy things, obviously. So it's so lower interest, lowering interest rates, uh, tax cuts, VAT tax cuts, those things did, were not very effective uh, in, in, uh, in dealing with this. Instead, <clears throat> what we thought was the single most important thing is how to get how to find ways to get income maintenance uh, and credit to corporates and to households that were hit by the by the uh, by the downturn. It's, for us, it was all about income support and maintaining the availability of credit. <clears throat> Some of you may know that we were instrumental with KFW to organize the flow of credit to corporate borrowers. Uh, some 30,000 of them. <clears throat> and so, because we thought that that was the way to go to make this work. Uh, <clears throat> now, this was an exogenous event and nobody's fault. So borrowing from the future to bring to the present to finance that it seemed a very optimal way of, deal of dealing with it. So by and large, we are, uh, did not have much by way of an issue with uh, the overall approach that was taken, <clears throat> apart from the fact that we didn't believe in, in demand management policies. So I think, when it comes to judging from here on out, how to deal with uh, lockdowns that may still be coming, I think we should remind ourselves that these dynamics are different than what most of us who study business cycles uh, have come to be used to. <clears throat> the second point I want to make before I talk about the uh, global macro in the US is that uh, the underlying has been uh, a paradigm shift in macro policy, which was very much brought to the fore by the pandemic. Uh, and this is what I call one of those mega trends uh, and, and a real paradigm change in macroeconomics. And that, and that is the, the historical enlargement of the goals of monetary and fiscal policy in demand management and beyond. Not a revolution, but a slow evolution. There is now, <clears throat> a growing belief and widespread that a more extensive use of monetary and fiscal policy can eliminate some, if not many, of the shortcomings of market economies, such as secular stagnation, achieving low unemployment rates across uh, all subsections of the workforce, including minorities, and of course, saving the euro. Regional disparities in growth and income now have become a target uh, in, in the US, for instance, and even quality of life disparities across different societal groups. And of course, uh, climate change, the ECB has been talking about that and the Bank of England. So this is now a list of policy goals that, that any pure Keynesian from the 60s and 1970s would find totally unrecognizable. So what has changed then? Uh, well, first, <clears throat> the inflation constraint is thought to have been lifted. Uh, the reduction in interest rates to zero or below, and the massive asset purchases and the direct lending through Teltro simply have not produced inflationary pressure. <clears throat> the, the impact on aggregate demand in Europe and in the US just has not been sufficient, nor has the growth in aggregates. So central banks can pretty much buy as much of uh, sovereign assets uh, as they desire, and we don't it doesn't show up in our usual measures of uh, inflationary pressure. Some of that has now been even extended by the recent change, for instance, in the Fed's mandate to hit an average inflation rate rather than hit the number two. This is an important relaxation uh, of, uh, of monetary policy goals because you can now define that average pretty much the way you want to and you can keep, rate, you can keep rates steady even if inflation goes to 3% for a period of a year or two. And I'll come back to that in a second. In addition, there's been a shift, certainly within the Fed, as the FOMC recently announced, from, from a forecast-based to an outcome-based approach. That, again, introduces an even longer lag in the way monetary policy reacts to, uh, to happenings on the inflation side. The second uh, 
uh, shift that has taken place is that the, the constraint on sovereign borrowing has been lifted as well to some extent. And basically, uh, persistently low interest rates in the face of uh, sovereign debt levels combined with the readiness of the central banks to backstop rises in rates uh, pretty much has removed interest rate as a constraint on sovereign borrowing. Uh, I think a look at Italy uh, uh, with a debt to GDP ratio of excess of 150% for this year, and with a spread above bonds of just 100 basis points, um, it is really a very, from an historical point of view, an extraordinary pricing of sovereign risk. Uh, <clears throat> so after more than a decade of, of historically low and negative interest rates, debt to GDP ratios above 100% have become tolerable. Um, a country sort of looks downright backwards if its ratio is below 100%, and, and the mastery criteria of, of 60%, they look almost quaint uh, when, when discussing this, and not likely to be achieved anytime soon. So the, the, basically, when we think about policy going forward and about, and about how this might end, it is important to recognize that the two historic constraints on policy that held things in place, inflation and debt sustainability, are increasingly being perceived by policymakers, not necessarily by investors, but by policymakers, as not being binding. Um, and there's sort of been three steps in the escalation of monetary and fiscal policy. One, what I call is MP1, interest rate policy, uh, and uh, with passive fiscal policy, but not really related. And then MP2, interest rate policy becomes ineffective and you have a, a QE uh, as an extension of it or direct lending through things like Teltro. Uh, and fiscal policy is still passive uh, uh, bystander. And then we finally ended up now after the pandemic with what I call MP3, interest rate policy is still ineffective, but fiscal policy now takes over and the central bank's role is increasingly one of uh, funding the deficit spending or fiscal policy through QE. Why does this matter? Um, well, when you work through interest rates and, uh, and even through QE at the, at, the, at the longer end of the curve, the price of credit, the single most important price in the economy, goes up and down. It is this price system, the invisible hand in a private sector that allocates the resources uh, through the circular movements of an economy. Whereas when you go to it, it's impersonal, it's just a price system that allocates resources. When you go to deficit fiscal spending with debt issuance monetized by the central bank, uh, the adjustments work through government programs that directly send resources to where they're thought to be needed. So it's a very targeted approach of uh, adjusting resources and, uh, uh, and, and jumpstarting the economy. Rather than doing it neutrally through a price system, you now have a political apparatus that uh, assigns the spending in order to stimulate the economy. <clears throat> the, the, uh, in addition, the, the, the possibility of using policy more uh, goals, policy more extensively, such as monetary policy and fiscal policy, um, that has brought into view a far greater number of goals than uh, we ever had before. Uh, you know, we generally have become far more risk averse uh, when it comes to recessions, uh, tolerance for recessions, unemployment at what would normally be regarded historical levels, cyclical levels, has very much declined. Uh, and evidence from the past 40 years suggests that central banks are now far more likely to lower rates when anticipating a downturn or keep rates lower for longer if growth is slow to return. We saw the Fed's episode in 2016 and 17 being a good example of that. <clears throat> uh, the second uh, extension is that Macro policy is no longer just demand management, the way classically trained economists think of it. It's requiring a much wider set of societal goals. For instance, with monetary policy, we no longer just talk about unemployment numbers, such as U3. Uh, in the US, we've now started very much to talk about a, dis a di disaggregated unemployment number for minority groups, for instance, in some regions of the country. And there, uh, we now talk in terms of the Fed, and you will have heard, some of you may have heard Powell's speeches recently. We talk about maximal employment targets <clears throat> rather than full employment at 4%. Um, and, and that put that together with an average inflation objective, and you can see how 
the, 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 uh, the ability of policy to think that these goals can be reached has been very much enhanced. Um, it's interesting to me that at an age where <clears throat> the word sustainable is used with almost everything that we touch and see and do, there's very little consideration being given to the longer term sustainability of macro policy. Uh, now, to the US. Uh, as is always the case, uh, the US as uh, the biggest and the most influential economy is leading the way, and that is also where the global risks are. Um, the US has become, as, as, as you know, it's become intensely political and polarized, and, and the macroeconomic and macro and, and other policy is, of course, no exception to this. So one has to see US policy, including macro policy, Fed and fiscal, very much to the political lenses of the day. <clears throat> uh, we have somewhat an advantage because we sort of think ourselves as sitting mid-Atlantic between Europe and the US as a research group and, and, and hopefully uh, have become less politicized than many of our colleagues in the US. Now, in the response to the pandemic, the US response was fast and it was overwhelming. <clears throat> the US passed the CARES Act on uh, March 27th last year, that was 2.2 trillion of almost all income support payments, just the way we would have recommended it. Uh, and and it, it will result according to the Congressional Budget Office, independent office, at about 2 trillion to debt, about 10% of GDP. In all these numbers, I will give you the dollar numbers, but always remember US GDP is roughly 20 billion. So it can easily convert it into percentages using 20 trillion uh, using that number. So 2.2 trillion, <clears throat> excuse me, was the first kind of, was the first stimulus package coming out of the Trump administration. Um, then there was an additional 600 throughout the year, and then a 900 billion stimulus was passed again in, in December 2002. Uh, the US disposable income in 2020 actually grew. It grew by about three and a half percent rather than falling, uh, even though we had people out of work and, uh, and very high numbers of unemployed. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the fast dispersing programs in the US were so powerful that the US disposable income uh, actually grew. So the total of 3.7 trillion or 18 percent of, of uh, GDP in 2020, <clears throat> we considered that it's a defensible number, it's, it's huge. But it's, it doesn't look totally strange. It's very generous, uh, but it got political support from both parties and from the population. And uh, if that had been it, I think that uh, it would have been perfect. It would have been efficient. It would have been a US economy, we figured, would have reached pre pandemic levels of unemployment and, uh, and GDP in early 2022. So, well on track. But then, the uh, Biden, Biden administration gained control of the Senate by uh, winning the Georgia senatorial uh, races and uh, uh, in quick succession put together another 1.9 trillion, uh, another 10% roughly uh, of uh, stimulus programs. This was passed uh, in a totally one partisan way and there was no Republican votes for this in the Senate. So, so that brings the total stimulus in the US to 5.6 trillion, uh, that is close to 30% of GDP. Now, comparison, <clears throat> the 1930s New Deal support packages, you, you remember that, that Roosevelt's packages, were only about 800 billion in today's dollars. The Obama stimulus package in 2009, after the global financial crisis, uh, was only about 850. The total cost of World War II over five years for the US in today's dollars was about 4 trillion. So a good 1.6 trillion less than the, uh, what was spent in the last 12 months in the US. So the 5.6 trillion stimulus, almost 30% of GDP, is just a truly historic number. And it takes us very much into uncharted territory uh, economically and politically. Uh, U.S. fiscal deficit in 2020 was 15 percent. It'll be again 15 percent in 2021. The debt to GDP ratio <coughs> will exceed 130 percent over the next in the next few years. At the same time, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the Fed will continue to buy 120 billion uh, per month into foreseeable future of uh, of uh, Treasuries and uh, 
and mortgage-backed securities, uh, or nearly 1.5 trillion per annum in 2021 and 2022. Um, and it will keep, FOMC expects to keep the Fed funds rate near zero in 2024. Uh, the Fed's portfolio has doubled uh, since the onset of the pandemic to reach 8 billion. Um, and with this rate of asset purchase, the Fed is financing more than half of the federal deficit over the coming two years. Um, I don't often do this, but, but let me uh, quote uh, uh, my good friend uh, uh, and former colleague, uh, Larry, Larry Summers, uh, who was a progressive economist, uh, slightly to the left, as you would recall, and Obama Secretary of the Treasury, so great progressive credentials. He calls this, uh, and I quote, that this is one of the greatest experiments in the use of extreme macroeconomic policy to stimulate growth and employment in a couple of generations. Likely, it will be one of the least responsible macro policies in 40 years. Uh, so that's a very damning judgment. Now, that's not all. In addition, the uh, current administration is planning to use its control of both houses to pass an infrastructure bill costing nearly $4 trillion, to be followed later by a human infrastructure bill costing another $2 trillion. Now, that is, is slightly less controversial because the expectation is that it gets financed <clears throat> out of an increasing corporate tax rate from 21 to 28. I suspect they'll settle on 25% error and enacting a global minimum tax for multinational corporations. Uh, now, it has to be passed. The taxes in particular, it's not so easy, but a good deal of it will make it through the Senate under sort of a special procedure that, uh, that has been employed to get around the uh, 60 vote uh, requirement. Now, <clears throat> the issue with infrastructure in the US is important to understand when you evaluate these programs is that the US has historically not been good at infrastructure projects. They tend to be highly political, highly politicized, they tend to be what Americans call pork barrel and paying off the states, paying off labor unions. And for instance, the Obama package of 800 billion was supposed to be mostly infrastructure. In fact, it turned out doing very, very little. Uh, Obama used to term that this 800 billion was, was being spent on shovel ready projects. But in fact, there was uh, uh, less than 10, 15% actually went into infrastructure. But it's important to recognize that these numbers are so big, uh, the 5.6 trillion and the infrastructure number, that, that they will support very big, bold programs if properly implemented on a bipartisan basis. And they will undoubtedly go a long way towards transforming an import, important parts of the US economy and the US political world. As much, I would say, perhaps even more so than the New Deal under Roosevelt. <clears throat> now, the outcome for us, or the immediate concern for, for us and for the people that I normally talk to, is the, is, is the following. This is going to produce what we have come to call a Goldilocks economy for 12 to 18 months. It will be anything unlike we have ever seen before. The result of such massive stimulus uh, is that we will get a, a boom year in uh, 2021 and the first half of 2022. Just a few indications. The aggregate stimulus expected in 2021 is about four times as large as the output gap uh, would have been, or the gap between actual and potential output. Uh, so it's four times as large as the output gap. <clears throat> um, at the same time, all the stimulus, we also have US savers that accumulated a total of 1.7 trillion in savings, in excess savings that is just waiting for pent up demand another 10% of GDP. So you put this all together, the 5.6 trillion stimulus, the, the almost 30% of GDP, the anticipated infrastructure bills, another 4 trillion, the 1.7 trillion excess corporate and household savings. And uh, you can just, you don't, you don't have to be a, a very insightful economist to understand this is gonna produce an absolutely massive boom. After declining in three and a half, by three and a half percent in 2020, we expect that US growth will run in the historical, totally unprecedented range of eight to 10%, more likely towards 10 and towards eight in 2021, and only slightly less in H122. Uh, just to add some credibility to that, the FOMC forecast 
the growth forecast for 2021 is already at six and a half percent. Now, FOMC is a conservative place and uh, they don't want to be caught having to talk their growth rates down so they start low and inch their way up. So six and a half for them is already a very high number, at least to suggest that they're also closer in, in line with us at 10%. The unemployment rate is expected to fall well below 4% by the end of 2021 and uh, below 3.5% in early part of 2022, the first half. That is less, that is half a percent less than what is used this in recent years has come to be regarded as uh, full employment levels. Equity valuations, of course, uh, where, where a good deal of the stimulus money has gone uh, through uh, retail investors, <clears throat> is already, uh, this, this, the S&P 500 is already up 10% this year, and we're expecting, conservatively expect, another increase of 5% by year end, driven by the strong economy and, and, and enormous earnings growth in the US of 23% earnings per share and no recession in sight. We fully expect that credit spreads, both high yield and high grade, will remain where they are, maybe slightly tightened uh, because of the declining default rates that comes from all the, all the stimulus payments around the US. That's the US. The divergence between the EU and the US uh, on this policy in this year is, is striking. Uh, <clears throat> there's not enough time here to go to take you through all the EU numbers and most of you know them anyway. But basically, the way to think about it is that the 2020 stimulus in the EU and the deficit numbers are roughly half the size of the US. And as a consequence, the growth forecast is roughly half as much. <clears throat> and the stimulus, not the number for the stimulus for 2021 is less than a quarter of the US number. Uh, and the same goes for debt and deficits. Uh, you all know German deficits, uh, uh, German debt to GDP has moved from 60 or will move from 60 to 80 percent, which is a very far cry from the US, which we expect to move uh, well above 130 uh, by, the end, by 2022. So these are very, very significantly different numbers. For once, our, uh, the EU uh, deserves uh, credit for staying on the safe side of uh, using stimulus packages. Now, this makes the US and not Europe the lead economy, the locomotive of the global economy in 2020 and 2021, uh, in tandem with China, uh, which has very similar growth rates. We expect China to grow also at 10% or maybe 9% in 2021. So you got these two economies that pretty much drive global developments. Now, where then lie the risks? Uh, what are the risks? Inflation, the inflation risk is, is a, uh, uh, perhaps the most serious of the risk. <clears throat> and the question is, is there something, is there a soft landing that can be engineered? So the Fed predicts that inflation will rise uh, only temporarily to come close to 3% in 2021 and then return to 2% in 2022. Uh, this is principally because the supply constraints in the economy drive up prices, as so it's thought, and, uh, <clears throat> and the prices will ease back once the supply uh, has taken care of itself. Um, we fully expect that the Fed will stick to that policy and not react to inflation numbers, even if these go beyond 3%. Uh, we, we're sufficiently close to uh, people at the Fed. The U, my US chief economist was the chief economist of the FOMC, and he tells me that the, that we can be very confident that as inflation goes above their 3% estimate, that they will not move because they will regard it as a, a temporary increase uh, that is going to abate uh, uh, down the road. Uh, we, we as a group also forecast inflation to rise to near 3% through 2021 and then into 3 to 4% more towards 4 towards the end of this year and early 22. The risks lie not in this year. This is going to be a boom year with inflation is going to remain anchored. <clears throat> the 10 year rate is going to remain anchored and the risk come in 2022. Um, we expect that once inflation rises, uh, of 4%, that it will stay elevated in that range. And uh, with the risk of accelerating beyond that, um, we see for now a strong sustained growth in monetary aggregates um, M2 is up 27%, and we expect this to continue. Uh, likewise with M3, 
The Fed, unfortunately, has stopped to publish M3 numbers uh, because they look more extreme than uh, what we see in M2. So <clears throat> the inflation indices, indices are mixed for now. Uh, there's no clear picture that emerges. We had today's CPI number of 2.6% year on year. It's inching, it's getting, it's moving up. Uh, producer prices have come in at a very high 6%. Uh, the five, five by five break even is running at 2.1%. Commodity prices are up 30%. Um, increase in input prices and services and manufacturing are also up uh, significantly double digits. Uh, <clears throat> but there's nothing in it later right now that could really make you want to jump and say, see, inflation has arrived, it's coming, and uh, expectations are being impacted and being unhinged, and we have to do something. We're not there yet. So this is very much a question of judgment. <clears throat> The more important uh, uh, forecast is that we do not expect the Fed, the Fed to react until very late, uh, not before 2023, which is in fact came out of the recent FOMC meeting. But even if the inflation picture deteriorates, the Fed will not react earlier, um, even, if price, even if, if price pressures emerge more clearly than what I have just taken you through. Um, there are several reasons why we think this. <clears throat> One of them is just from talking to people on the board and, and, and the economics groups. But the other one is that the Fed board will come to reflect the politics of the Biden administration before long. That there is a vacancy that's now being filled with a fairly radical uh, 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 dovish uh, member. And uh, uh, there's a very good chance that Powell will not get reappointed, even though Powell is not the most hawkish uh, of uh, Fed chairman. Uh, likely he will not get reappointed. So, there is a, so Biden has a real chance over the next 12 months to redo the board in his image. The, uh, uh, the people surrounding the administration, <clears throat> the, the, the advisors on these issues, uh, tend to have very little uh, concern and fear for inflation becoming unhinged. And that I regard as one of the most troublesome aspects of this. So no, we do not expect the Fed to react. And there, uh, uh, that is what we see as the major problem. Let me just one more quote uh, from, uh, from Powell uh, just recently. Powell said, we consider raising rates when the labor market recovery is essentially complete and we're back to maximum employment and inflation is back to our 2% goal and is on track to move above 2% for some time. It'll be a while until we get in that place. That is three and a half percent unemployment. And it is actual uh, number, not a forecast. So from that, you can see that, uh, that uh, there really is a very strong predisposition to stay put. Now, for those of you who seek lessons in history because the, uh, much of our quantitative macro modeling doesn't work very well anymore, uh, I would suggest that you go back and look at the analogy of these events uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, where we had the same situation. Inflation was very low, almost non-existent. Then came the, the, the Johnson Guns and Butter program, that means Vietnam War with, with the guns and the Great Society programs with the butter. And you saw an increase in deficits, inflation picked up. Uh, after a few years, the Fed comes in and sort of does a little bit of a lackluster uh, 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 monetary tightening, inflation goes down a little bit, but then it comes back up. By the time we get to the late 70s, there was an oil price shock that also aggravated that situation, uh, but oil price shocks don't create permanent inflation, obviously. Um, so then by the time we got to the late 70s, inflation was in double digits. The central bank was not able, uh, for various considerations, politics and otherwise, to deal with it until Paul Walker in 1980 change tack and, uh, and really crunch down, producing a very, very deep and prolonged recession, uh, uh, taking unemployment into the double digits for almost uh, 12 months. Uh, and uh, uh, only with Reagan's support was he able to see that through. I believe that historical narrative is where, this, where all of this is, is, is taking us. Um, <clears throat> it is important though, when you compare this with high inflation episodes elsewhere that I believe in the end, the US will opt for a tough anti-inflation policy. <clears throat> Once inflation gets into the five, six, seven, eight percent and stays there <coughs> for a year or two, 
The problem is that is not a, that would not be a soft landing. Uh, um, there never in, there never has been a soft landing in U.S. financial history. The monetary tightening and it, it, it occurred at inflation rates above four percent. So we expect in 2023 a, a very hard crippling landing with a deep and lasting recession with tremendous global spillovers uh, into the rest of the world and a potential political instability. Uh, the timing of this, as always with these things, monetary, monetary policy has long and varied legs, as we know, uh, so it's hard to time. <clears throat> but I think the end of 22, early 23 is something that is, a, is going to be a highly precarious period. Uh, so that is something when we talk to institutions around the world, we, we, we are, uh, advise them to prepare for uh, in the coming year being a boom year, but then get ready for this uh, very difficult, first a transition in 22 and a very difficult 23. Now, <clears throat> there's one final observation I want to make, and that is, in the background of this are financial stability risks. <clears throat> markets, you recall, markets reacted violently when Bernanke spoke of tapering in 2013. <clears throat> this time will be worse um, because we have run a lot longer. Um, so the Fed will have made difficulties in tightening without producing a potentially destabilizing repricing in markets. Markets and investors have operated for a very long time in an environment of low interest rates, loss of liquidity, and a lot of backstops. We always knew that when, when, that when, the, uh, when, the, when the S&P fell by 10, 15% that the Fed would step in. So you had these, these various insurances, these puts in the system, and that has created risk, uh, and you, all the, you cannot see all of this. So there has been a high level of risk taking. Margin debt is high. Uh, there's been a surge in SPACs, these, these uh, special vehicles, underwriting vehicles. Covenants have, the covenants have become much lighter. Um, there's a disconnect between finance and mainstream. Uh, we've already had some financial near accidents. So that comes on top of when you wait too long and you tighten then, uh, then you have to also start worrying about their uh, um, financial instabilities. Uh, in summary then, I think it's important when we think about the downturn and about the recovery uh, that is engineered by lockdowns to keep in mind that the dynamics of this are very different from cyclical downturns, that the, the standard macro models and macro thinking does not get you very good estimates of what will happen. Uh, secondly, I think it's very important to bear in mind as we look at, as we do unconditional forecasts, in other words, forecasts that are not conditional on a policy, that there, uh, there's been a creeping expansion of mandates for monetary and fiscal policy beyond just the managing the business cycle fluctuations. Uh, third, um, persistent low inflation, low, low rates for more than a decade have reduced uh, perception of inflation risk and debt sustainability risk. We have become very used to it. The generation that still understands high, high uh, inflation and high rates uh, is gone for, for, for almost all of them. Uh, so it'll be a problem to make people alert to that again. Um, the US, number four, the US is leading the pack uh, with a massive stimulus that is, that is historically beyond anything we have seen, including all the big wars. This is just a completely new page. <clears throat> so our ability to understand how it will work is, is somewhat limited because these order of magnitudes is something that we all have to get used to first. It produces historical deficits, historical debt levels, um, and uh, we will have a, a blowout boom economy in 2021 uh, with bills to be paid thereafter. We expect the rise in US inflation that is now very, very gently underway, that it will continue and uh, that it will not just be temporary, <clears throat> but that it will be driven by monetary, by the, by the central bank uh, uh, balance sheet developments, and uh, that the Fed will not react uh, until it is too late. Uh, and we expect that that reaction, when it finally does occur uh, in a couple of years' time, is going to produce a very, very significant crisis with a restructuring of the world economy, the likes that we have not seen. Uh, and uh, the risk is that it will also unhinge and have a significant impact on the politics of uh, 
major countries. Uh, let me then stop there and uh, invite you to uh, uh, ask whatever you like on whatever topic yeah. you like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. I haven't covered. Thank you very much, David, and thanks for giving that really big picture of what's lying ahead of us. Uh, um, also putting it into a perspective of the paradigm shifts that we that we currently face in macroeconomics. Uh, the floor is open for discussion. There is one question already by Torsten Althaus um, on the very impressive US numbers. Seems there is a US boom coming today's generations have not experienced so far. Do you have something in your mind as to what this could mean for daily reality? Wage increases, labor force shortages, agrar inflations, thus just something that seems to fit with your expectations. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, obviously in any boom economy, I expect that uh, this will, uh, and already has of course, uh, show up in markets first, in asset markets. We expect very significant price increases in the principal assets, in, in equity, uh, and uh, real estate, obviously. <clears throat> we fully expect unemployment rate to go below 2.5%, so we will have a, a, a well through full employment. And uh, as I said, we expect prices, both consumer prices, uh, certainly consumer prices, to remain subdued, except in some sectors that experience in, uh, a supply bottlenecks. <clears throat> and uh, the interesting question, which I thought you might be leading to, is what is going to be the political implication of this? As you know, we have an election coming up in the US, a midterm election in 2022. And uh, it's a crucial election because if the Democrats, if, if the Biden people are, uh, uh, retain control of the House and uh, keep control of the Senate, uh, then I believe the picture I've painted will be more than worn out. Uh, you will get even more of it uh, because there is a, we need to kind of understand the US, the intellectual side of this, uh, it's not, it, it has become so uh, bad to some extent, it almost makes you laugh. For those of you who are familiar with the modern monetary theory, you realize that it's just, it's neither modern nor it's a theory. It, it, it's just says you can go and spend and spend as long as you do it in your own currency and run out deficits. And, and that, that enjoys a certain amount of, of uh, buy-in uh, across the, uh, in the Washington politics right now. So if the Democrats retain uh, uh, <clears throat> the two houses, then I think this will be borne out. Should the Republicans uh, uh, get control of the House, then I believe the fiscal side will look a lot more conservative. Uh, and if they also get the Senate, then I believe the ability to put uh, more radically dovish uh, board members in place will be more constrained. So I think the outcome is very, very, that outcome is very, very important. And right now, I would say that uh, we spend an awful lot of time trying to predict it. It's 50-50, it's we just don't know. Hmm. Yeah, we have another question asking, uh, given that the volatilities are reasonably low again, is it sensitive to buy vol now or would that be too early as financial markets are likely to remain calm for the next 12 months? I would say it's definitely too early. I would expect volume to go down, get down further. Uh, <clears throat> but because uh, uh, the fairly massive involvement of the Fed uh, and uh, all of the stimulus money, which in the US actually has a name, they call the stimmies. But all the stimmy is now flowing into the equity market, or a good deal of it, and so retail participation is important. So generally, there's there's nothing really that could upset the the the, the potential for a tax increase is not enough to have a big impact on earnings, and it's going to be implemented over a number of years. So I think it's fairly subdued as far as that's concerned. So no, I don't see uh, events that uh, would have a great impact on increasing volatility. Would I challenge you a little bit on the Chinese economy? You were, uh, you were um, uh, talking about 10% growth the next year. Don't you see any risk also with the developments in China? Instability of, of markets, uh, the, this political influence in, in, in firms that, that may cause problems? Uh, let, let me answer that. Uh, I can answer that with great confidence. And the answer is no. No. Uh, and the reason for that is that most observers, particularly those who haven't sort of spent serious time in China, 
they underestimate the ability of uh, the government and the party machinery to control the principal actors. <clears throat> you will have watched what happened to Alibaba uh, and, uh, and, and Tencent. And, and so you see, <clears throat> there, the PBOC's ability to keep markets stable is enormous. Uh, their financial ability to keep doing that for the next three years is uh, beyond anything that's required. Uh, they have enough reserves to recapitalize state banks should that become necessary. <clears throat> they have enough financial, have enough fiscal headroom that if they need to stimulate the economy through further infrastructure development, they will do that. Uh, so I think that the, the, the often heard concern about financial instability in China because you see a bank having problems in near Manchuria, or banks having problems on, in the far out west, um, that is easily dealt with. Now, I think the problem is more uh, political and mm -hmm. geopolitical. And, and, and that is, of course, uh, the big uncertainty that hangs over our head. Uh, I believe that the, the risk of a Chinese pressure on Taiwan, that that intensifies over the next month to a year, is very great. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think they completely underestimate the resolve of the Biden administration in getting back. Uh, and that can easily spin out of control. If that happens, then you will, then all bets are off, particularly on the market side, because it can impact equity markets very severely. But I think that is the real risk with China. It's not so much economic instability, it's more the fact that the, that the leadership uh, is being put in a position where they want to do what they did in Hong Kong, which most of us thought was quite unreasonable, never had expected because they had no real gain, economic gain for them. But Taiwan has a real gain because <clears throat> the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company mm -hmm. is the only is the company in the world that produces most advanced chips, about 80% of them. And the Chinese can shut it down. Then uh, your children's Nintendo games, the, the new version, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't work anymore uh, because those chips come from there or the, or, or the chips in, in US and uh, European fighter planes, uh, the, the replacements won't be able to be procured. Mm -hmm. So Taiwan is hugely important and the Chinese know it. Uh, <clears throat> and it's very, very difficult um, to rule that out. Uh, I mean, the, the example is if, if we had sort of asked ourselves, what will they do to Hong Kong, let's say a year ago, we would never have come up with thinking that they would actually have a complete political takeover. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same way, I think if we wake up one morning and we see that the, the, uh, the mainland is blockading our, uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. we won't be surprised. You know, we said, yeah, that, that kind of what we thought might happen. So I think that is a huge risk with, with regard to China and geopolitically. Mm -hmm. There's one question asking, uh, do you think the Chinese could control some commodity prices, uh, iron ore, copper, or others to avert to high inflation pressure? Yes, uh, I mean we see what they've done with iron ore in, in, in Australia, and they're prepared to they're prepared to uh, play hardball if they don't if if they get criticised politically, as they're doing with Australia. Whether they can actually sort of control prices by getting the price to be in a particular range uh, to hurt the supplier, that depends on what it is. If it's a question of rare rare earth, mm -hmm. the answer is yes. Or, uh, Mm -hmm. If it's a question of iron or the answer or oil, the answer probably is not. Uh, so, the, the, the global markets are big, and uh, no, China is big, but it's not that big to have that kind of uh, uh, control. Yeah, Omar Ising has a question. Mm -hmm. Sends his best regards and thanks for your presentation. And he would like to know sh what should, in your opinion, be the exit for fiscal monetary policy uh, in the US or in the euro area? How could that be managed? Uh, good evening, Omar. Uh, happy to answer your question. <clears throat> I believe that <clears throat> one, this should have started a long time ago <clears throat> in the sense when the US in, when was it, 2016, uh, 17, uh, I mean, the US tightened uh, and, re and, and rates went up. And then, the, and then there was a slight increase in their, uh, unemployment and they immediately let go. I believe we should have seen that through and let it work out by itself. So the, <clears throat> the exit has to be of a, uh, a gradual 
withdrawal. For instance, I was very, very, I'm, I'm very astonished as to how radically uh, the Fed uh, speaks of that they don't want to do any tapering. <clears throat> now, we're not talking about raising rates, we're talking about mm -hmm. reducing the monthly purchase from 120, let's say, to 80. Um, now, we're going to have an economy that, that, that is already growing uh, very significantly, and that year on year will grow near 10%. This, to me, would have been the time now to say, uh, Yes, we see, we, see, we see some underlying pressure and we're going to start tapering. And then uh, we will think in terms of raising rates perhaps at the beginning of uh, 2022 rather than in 24. So to some extent, uh, I, would, I, would, I would have brought all that forward by maybe two years <clears throat> and to start talking about it earlier. And yes, in, in my world, that would have been enormous pain uh, I think that equity markets would have reacted violently to that. But that's the pain as a central banker you need to be able to take. And uh, the Fed is no longer prepared to take that because they feel that through wealth effects and so it feeds into the real economy. So I think that, that uh, we're letting it run much too fast uh, and, and much too long. Uh, and uh, it, it's not going to get any better. <clears throat> Maybe just to, to conclude the discussion, two questions that uh, uh, tackle two points that you did not talk about. One is your expectation on the market for carbon certificates, something that also the Biden administration apparently is uh, very much after and also uh, the, the ECB is talking about uh, going into the sustainability issues and the other is a question on the, whether you see any negative effect for the global financial stability from un, further unlimited cryptocurrency growth. So the carbon, the carbon certificates and cryptocurrency, what's your opinion on that? Well, <clears throat> so whether it's carbon certificates or whether it's a, a carbon tax, uh, if you are a if you think like an economist, these are the obviously thing, obvious things to do. And uh, everyone who has, is in an advisory position keeps pushing those. Uh, and the problem is that the political acceptance is very limited, even in the US. Uh, there have been some surveys recently about the imposition of carbon taxes. And the, among economists, it's almost 99% in favor. Among the general population, it's like you know, two thirds, 80% uh, against. So, uh, um, it's really a question of, uh, um, I, I believe we as economists that haven't done our job very well in, their, uh, in, in, in being persuasive that, that if you don't want quantitative rules and if you don't want uh, uh, governments to prescribe what you can and cannot do, uh, uh, then you need to find a, a, tax, a tax system that uh, will do that. And carbon taxes <clears throat> or carbon certificates, it's just not a way of doing it, is, uh, would be the way to go. But I'm not that optimistic that we will be seeing a massive increase in either. Yeah, and the cryptocurrency, is that something oh, yes. that will get boosted by this uh, inflation expectations that, that you were talking about? Uh, um, to some extent, yes. But uh, uh, when you think in terms of crypto and gold, uh, comparison is often made that Gold's been around for thousands of years. It's been a store of value for thousands of years, even though it isn't, used, it isn't good for anything, yet it has real value. It, but it has, the, it has the weight of uh, centuries of history behind it where people have thought that it was worth something and, make, and that is what gives gold value, uh, however ephemeral that is. Uh, crypto is a slightly different thing. It doesn't take very much from the, uh, the Fed, the ECB, or, or the BIS as, as a joint organization to, to uh, put it to death uh, by simply prohibiting it. Uh, so we have to kind of be very careful in how we think about crypto. Um, and I am skeptical that uh, the monetary authorities will so easily uh, allow seniorage to be taken away from them by some uh, guys who come up with more uh, more bitcoins. Uh, I, I just don't think that's how the political world works. There's serious serious money to be made by issuing this, not just by the holders. And I don't think that that uh, central banks will sit idly by and letting that happen. <clears throat> uh, but anything that that uh, enhances their um, 
um, uh, like that enhances, that gives us other alternatives, that introduces a certain amount of competition uh, among monies, it, it's I've always regarded as a good thing. Uh, so, but we have to be careful that, there, uh, I mean, there's a broader issue here. Um, uh, and that is, we're sort of at a crisis in capitalism in the sense that, that there, there's just an enormous amount of criticism of income distribution of the ability to make money quickly and uh, we have to be very careful that, that all the money that's being made in crypto doesn't kind of add a lot of fire on those flames because it's gonna come back to our doorstep and, and get people like Trump elected. So I think, I think there is a broader issue here as to how to, uh, how to think about this. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and I'm concerned about that. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Uh, that was really a great uh, presentation and a very, very interesting discussion. So uh, a lot of uh, urgent problems that uh, you uh, tackled and uh, we, will, we will see what comes out of this uh, for, the, for the coming years. Um, let me switch to German. Um, ich würde gerne noch ankündigen, die nächste Veranstaltung im Rahmen dieser Reihe und äh, wie, wie es nicht besser passen könnte, wird sie dem Thema digitale Währungen gewidmet sein. Am 18. Mai wird äh, Jörg Krämer von der Commerzbank über digitales Zentralbankgeld, äh, Chancen und äh, Probleme äh, sprechen. Und dazu darf ich äh, auch wieder herzlich einladen. Äh, darf noch mal ganz herzlich äh, David Volkerts Landau danken für den heutigen Vortrag und allen, die an der Diskussion äh, teilgenommen haben. Ich wünsche allen noch einen schönen Nachmittag und Abend und verabschiede mich bis zum nächsten Mal. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you.